to chapter 13 of the late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. The late Mr. Jonathan Wilde the Great by Henry Fielding. Book 2, chapter 13. The conclusion of the boat adventure and the end of the second book. Our hero passed the remainder of the evening, the night, and the next day, in a condition not much to be envied by any passion of the human mind, unless by ambition, which, provided it can only entertain itself with the most distant music of fame's trumpet, can disdain all the pleasures of the sensualist, and those more solemn, though quieter comforts, which a good conscience suggests to a Christian philosopher. He spent his time in contemplation, that is to say, in blaspheming, cursing, and sometimes singing and whistling. At last, when cold and hunger had almost subdued his native fierceness, it being a good deal past midnight and extremely dark, he thought he beheld a light at a distance, which the cloudiness of the sky prevented his mistaking for a star. This light, however, did not seem to approach him, at least it approached by such imperceptible degrees, that it gave him very little comfort, and at length totally forsook him. He then renewed his contemplation as before, in which he continued, till the day began to break, when, to his inexpressible delight, he beheld a sail at a very little distance, and which luckily seemed to be making towards him. He was likewise soon espied by those in the vessel, who wanted no signals to inform them of his distress, and, as it was almost a calm, and their course lay within five hundred yards of him, they hoisted out their boat, and fetched him aboard. The captain of this ship was a Frenchman. She was laden with deal from Norway, and had been extremely shattered in the late storm. This captain was of that kind of men who are actuated by general humanity, and whose compassion can be raised by the distress of a fellow creature, though of a nation whose king hath quarrelled with the monarch of their own. He therefore, commiserating the circumstances of Wilde, who had dressed up a story proper to impose upon such a silly fellow, told him that, as himself well knew, he must be a prisoner on his arrival in France, but that he would endeavour to procure his redemption, for which our hero greatly thanked him but as they were making very slow sail, for they had lost their mainmast in the storm, Wilde saw a little vessel at a distance, they being within a few leagues of the English shore, which, on inquiry, he was informed, was probably an English fishing-boat, and it being then perfectly calm, he proposed that, if they would accommodate him with a pair of scullers, he would get within reach of the boat, at least near enough to make signals to her, and he preferred any risk to the certain fate of being a prisoner. As his courage was somewhat restored by the provisions, especially brandy, with which the Frenchman had supplied him, he was so earnest in his entreaties that the captain, after many persuasions, at length complied and he was furnished with scullers, and with some bread, pork, and a bottle of brandy. Then, taking leave of his preservers, he again betook himself to his boat, and rowed so heartily that he soon came within the sight of the fisherman, who immediately made towards him, and took him aboard. No sooner was Wilde got safe on board the fisherman than he begged him to make the utmost speed into deal, for that the vessel which was still in sight was a distressed Frenchman, 
bound for Havre de Grace, and might easily be made a prize if there was any ship ready to go in pursuit of her. So nobly and greatly did our hero neglect all obligations conferred on him by the enemies of his country, that he would have contributed all he could to the taking his benefactor, to whom he owed both his life and his liberty. The fisherman took his advice, and soon arrived at Deal, where the reader will, I doubt not, be as much concerned as Wilde was, that there was not a single ship prepared to go on the expedition. Our hero now saw himself once more safe on terra firma, but, unluckily, at some distance from that city where men of ingenuity can most easily supply their wants without the assistance of money, or, rather, can most easily procure money for the supply of their wants. However, as his talents were superior to every difficulty, he framed so dexterous an account of his being a merchant, having been taken and plundered by the enemy, and of his great effects in London, that he was not only heartily regaled by the fishermen at his house, but made so handsome a booty by way of borrowing, a method of taking which we have before mentioned to have his approbation, that he was enabled to provide himself with a place in the stage-coach, which, as God permitted it to perform the journey, brought him at the appointed time to an inn in the metropolis. And now, reader, as thou canst be in no suspense for the fate of our great man, since we have returned him safe to the principal scene of his glory, we will a little look back on the fortunes of Mr. Hartfree, whom we left in no very pleasant situation. But of this we shall treat in the next book. End of Book 2, Chapter 13 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox.